Hi, I'm Kevin Clarkson. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prophecy in the News. We are joined today by our good friend, Gary Frazier, and he is not only a pastor and evangelist, but quite the man who tours Israel, a lover of the nation of Israel, and we are talking today about his new book, Miracle of Israel. Gary, welcome. Hey, Kevin, such a joy to be back with you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited about the content today because, you know, uh, we talk about prophecy and we think about Christ returning. So much of the roots of all that are embedded in the Old Testament and the nation of Israel, and it even returns to that at the time of the end. They really are. And, you know, one of the things, and of course, as I wrote this book, Miracle of Israel, along with my co-host, uh, Jim Fletcher, or co-writer, I should say, not co-host, but co-writer. Right. And uh, one of the things that uh, was in our heart to do was to write, first of all, about Israel past, Israel present, Israel present, Israel future. And, you know, one of the things is, is that when we wrote this book, I wanted to start this on the basis of the fact that the very existence of Israel is the greatest miracle in the history of the world since the life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven of Jesus Christ. I agree with that. And there's no, everything else in history pales into insignificance, that is, in recent history, as I said, since Christ, because there never has been a group of people separated from their land more than about 300 years and then ever reconstituted as a people. It truly is the miracle of history. And what's amazing about that is not just that they're there, but that the ancient prophets wrote about the fact that they would be there. And that gives validity to the fact that there is a creator God in heaven. And when they returned, they not only recaptured their ancient city, but they reinstituted their ancient language. They did. It's phenomenal. A in fact, I write in the book, uh, and you know this story, but uh, the, 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 this process uh, being scattered and separated from the land in 70 A.D. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But the process of the return to the land, the fulfillment of God's promises, like Ezekiel 36, 24, when he says, For I will take you out of the countries, gather you out of the nations, and bring you back, and you will live in the land. And Isaiah talks about it, and on and on and on. The prophets wrote about this. But the amazing thing about that is, is that we've seen that happen in our lifetime, but it's a, been an incremental process. And God started, as I said a moment ago, in a barn, outside Paris in 1878 when he gave a vision to a Russian-born Jew uh -huh. by the name of Eliezer ben Yehuda. And the vision was for the rebirth of the Jewish, the Hebrew language, which had largely been lost with the exception of just for liturgical purposes. And so you can't have a group of people living in harmony with each other when they can't even understand each other. So that was the process. And it moved from there ultimately to what we'll talk about later, and that is the first Zionist conference. So God has been working to bring about and to give testimony to the fact that he is the creator and he has ultimate control of the world. Well, it's utterly fascinating. And if you're joining us now, this is the first of two programs and we're going to be talking about Israel's past and then in an upcoming program about the present and future. And the Bible speaks to all of it. And uh, Gary, you, you're so well versed in this, but just for the sake of maybe some viewers that have joined us, you know, many people uh, across America anyway, and probably uh, most of Western civilization, when they visit churches, they no longer hear about Israel. Right. Uh, there's a replacement theology at work. And today there's even a dearth of uh, teaching on end time prophecy. Mm. And there's even a movement among a lot of evangelicals now to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. That is, they are siding with the poor, oppressed, as they say, Palestinians, and Israel has come in as the occupier mm -hmm. and needs to be really splitting up the land and all the political pressure, and we're seeing all of this play out before our eyes. Now, you would say, I believe, that we shouldn't be surprised. Well, I, I would. I would say that because when we actually take a common sense approach of reading Scripture, literally, unless there's a reason not to, we find that when the creator spoke the world into creation at the end of every day of creation he said it was good until the day he created man on the sixth day and the creator said it was very good and so god obviously was pleased with the creation process amen but it wasn't very long till we get to genesis chapter six where we find that god is saying he's grieved in his heart that he'd even created mankind because man thought only to do evil always and out of that god moved in the heart of a man by the name of noah to build this ark because there was going to be a, and regardless of what you may have been told by, <laughs> by some folks, it's a worldwide, you know, catastrophic event when Global every flood. living being was destroyed with the exception of those eight inside the ark and those animals. But when they come out from that ark, you would have thought that because of that, the wickedness that those descendants 
uh, had seen. That is, Noah and his wife, three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, their wives. You would have thought that they would have said, you know what, we're going to live for God no matter what because we've seen what happens. You know, we saw what happened in this world. They began the process of repopulating the world and it wasn't very long until we find them in Genesis 11 in the plain of Shinar now trying to build a tower to reach into the heavens that they might worship the sun God. And at uh-huh. that point, God comes down and confuses their language. Now, why would I bring that up? Because it's important, I think, to understand the progression of God's eternal plan for the ages. Do you think that was a surprise to God? Never. And, and the fact is that, in, that our listeners and our viewers need to be reminded that for God, the past, or the future rather, is the past to him. Right. Because he's looking back on all history because he's already seen the climax of all history. So God is never taken by surprise or off guard. So God knew it was going to happen. So God had a plan. And it was not plan B. That was, God, that was plan A from the beginning. God knew exactly how this was going to work out. And the, so what does God do? We find that in Genesis 11, he's looking around. And in his own sovereignty, because he knows the heart of every man, he picks Abram. He knows his heart is, is toward God. That's right. Has a bent toward God. And he is going to bring a new ethnicity upon the face of the earth. Our viewers should be reminded that in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, which compasses, and by the way, I'm a young earth guy, okay? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, <coughs> I believe we're approaching 6,000 years of man's time upon earth. Those first 2,000 years, though, encompass Genesis 1 to 11. There's one kind of people on the earth, and they are all Gentiles. Mm-hmm. But then God decides he's going to do a new thing. He's going to bring a new ethnicity upon the face of the earth. So enter Abram. Dwelling in Ur of the Chaldees, God leads him down the path to the land that he says, I'll, I will show you, and if you'll go, I'll bless you. Uh, you'll be a, I'll make you a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Whoever curses you, him will I curse, and so forth, Genesis 12, 3. But then we also find that Abraham had some questions. It's like, God, we don't have a kid. How, how, how are you going <laughs> to bless yeah, us? How am I going to be the father of, of nations when I don't have a dis, you know I don't a, have an heir and that's what his name means exactly father <laughs> yeah, of a multitude right and so uh, he says hey can we talk about this a minute uh, because there seems to be a problem here with the game plan something's missing yeah and so uh, as we all know I, I think students of scripture know that Abraham and Sarah thought in the natural realm so Abraham goes into Hagar the handmaiden of Sarah has a child Ishmael God Abraham loved him but that wasn't God plan, God's plan God was going to bring a new ethnicity on the face of the earth and so this time God enters into this covenant relationship and it's recorded uh, Kevin as you and many of our watchers already know in Genesis chapter 15 but it 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 is a it is a covenant that is so important that we understand because it is God wanting to swear, if I could use that term, make an oath with. He does. Who does he swear to? Who himself. There is no one. There There's was no, no greater. greater. So he ends up making a covenant with himself, swearing to himself. And in that covenant, he <coughs> delineates the land that the descendants of Abraham through this miraculous child will have. And he gives us a whole long list of how all of these lands <laughs> that are occupied by the Ites, we'll call them the Hittites, the Perizzites, the, Eph- the Rephites, the Amorites, and all those folks. How that land is actually going to be given to the descendants of Abraham through the child of promise Isaac. Now, why do I keep saying the descendants of Abraham through the child of promise Isaac? It is because we have this whole group of people today who say, but wait a minute. We are the descendants yeah. of, of Abraham the Ishmaelites. because we came through the <coughs> Ishmaelite line. And God was clear that that was not his plan. And uh, it's really interesting to me that when God enters this covenant, that it's clear that it is a forever and always everlasting covenant. And that's become, that becomes vital because of what's happening today. And you referenced this earlier. This is glossed over by so many people. Absolutely. But it is, an un, as I see it, it's an unconditional everlasting covenant. That's correct. And, here's why, and here's why it's unconditional. It's God with God. That's right. So how can what the Jews do or don't do affect that covenant? It can't. He, it never says in the text, I'm going to swear by myself that if the Jews do this, thus and so. It never says that. God just says, I'm the creator of it all. I own the title <coughs> deed of the earth. I am going to do this, and I swear by myself that I will do it. So God had to then perform on the land promise or he'd be a liar himself. That's and right. God cannot lie. That's right. And so this whole argument today that, that seems to be a hot-button issue in churches across the country, 
uh, as to who the land belongs to. God actually resolved that question mark many years ago. 4,000 years right. ago, God solved this issue. So we're right, we write in the book about the past so that people would understand how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. <clears throat> and the other side of that is it's really important to understand and as we write in the first section of the book that is the past that we lay the, the foundation so that we can then build upon it as we move through the book and teaching the, the truths there. But I do want to just read one thing if I may. I, I, I can yeah, paraphrase it, but I'd like to read it because it really <coughs> does go to the very essence of this covenant relationship because in Genesis chapter 17, God, who is never taken by surprise, uh, knew that the question would come up, uh, well, uh, but what about Ishmael? Yeah. And what about his descendants? And so did God love Ishmael? And the answer is absolutely. God loves all of his creation. And so the issue came, comes up about how Abraham and Sarah will have this child in, in their old age. And it was humorous really to them because, mm -hmm. I mean, after all, Abraham's 99, she's 89, and they're going to have a child nine months down the line or so. Nevertheless, here's what happens in verse 19. Then God said, actually responding to a question by Abraham in verse 18, if only, Abraham says, Ishmael might live under your blessing. So God answers that and says, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear a child to you and you will call him Isaac. And this is real critical. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant. Yeah, there it is. There's the key word. Ever, and ever we preach about everlasting, everlasting life. Covenant. We do. And we believe and tell that that's forever. Don't we? Isn't that literal? It's uh, perseverance of the life. saints. It's unconditional. It's from God. Mm -hmm. And it's right. the same word now in the Old Testament. Yes, it is. It, the, the, the definition of everlasting is pretty simple. Everlasting. Yep. And you don't have to be a scholar to understand that's that. That's right. And he says an everlasting <coughs> covenant for his descendants after him. And now here's the beautiful part. Because God is a God of love and mercy and compassion. He says, and as for Ishmael, I've heard you and I will surely bless him. He says, I'll make him fruitful, will greatly increase his numbers, and he'll be the father of 12 rulers, and I'll make him into a great nation. But the key to this whole thing is found in verse 21 when God, after he says that, then he says, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to, to, uh, uh, to you by this time next year. Right. So God, you know, knowing that the issue would be could get a little confused because of the birth of Ishmael, God wanted to make sure that there was no ambiguity, perfect clarity about that his covenant relationship was not, was not just with the descendants of Abraham, but the descendants of Abraham that would come through this miraculous born type, if you please, of the virgin birth of Christ, child born in their old a age. A supernatural. And this covenant goes to the ownership of the land, not the use of the land. Now today, m part of the problem we have, as you know, Kevin, is that this question mark that you brought up earlier about you uh -huh. know, the poor Palestinians, uh, this idea of social justice, you know, the Jews. Occupation. Yeah, you know, the Jews have been, been mean and blah, 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 blah. Well, the, that just reveals a lack of an understanding of the differences in the covenants. And that is that this covenant is a covenant that goes to the ownership of the land. And it is forever and for always. It's forever lasting. The land has always and will always belong to the Jews because the creator gave it to them. Even when they weren't there for centuries. Even when they were driven out. Yeah. That said, God went a step further later under the time of the prophet Moses. And in Deuteronomy chapters 28 through 30, he uh, lays out what we call the Mosaic, Mosaic Covenant. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the usage of the land. So in other words, you're my chosen, the land belongs to you. But whether or not you get to reap the benefits of that depends on your obedience to me. And so God, because again, he knows the end from the beginning, he writes about what will ultimately happen to them. And it's interesting that in Deuteronomy 28, verses 57 and forward, he writes about how because of their sin, ultimately Moses said, you'll be scattered into all the nations of the world. This was conditional. That was conditional. Usage, not That's ownership. That's right. Usage. He said, Big distinction. if you obey me, you'll always be the head. You'll never be the tail. You'll if be you obey land, me, you'll, you'll always. That's right. And he but gives if you that, disobey me. That's right. And that goes to whether or not I get the, to reap the benefit of the blessing of, of occupying the land. And they, and they lost that because of their sin. And finally, as we all know, in 70 AD, because they had rejected the Messiah, uh, finally, in 70 A.D., the Romans scatter them, sell them into the slave markets of the world. And they lost the use of the land, but only temporarily. 
Yes. And that's the key. So why would God then work to fulfill his promises for the final regathering of the Jews to their land? Because it goes to his integrity, character, credibility. The God who cannot lie said, okay, you lose the use for a time, but there will be a time when I'll bring you back into your land. And fortunately for us, we have had the benefit of seeing that promise fulfilled. Mm, and that is so important for our listeners to understand. The honor of God himself is at stake. It is. And, you know, here's the, he, and if I could say one thing to viewers of this program, that, well, actually, let me say two things. Uh, because I'm a preacher, we can't say just one. Uh, but the first thing is I would say to any person out there who may have one, any out of a question mark about whether or not there is a creator or whether or not we're just the process of, primordial slime over time uh -huh. the very <coughs> fact that israel exists validates a creator god it really does if, if a person Truly. would be intellectually honest it validates that but the second thing i'd say for every believer is this the fact that israel exists today just further validates the fact that god always keeps his promise and if he keeps his promises to the jews kevin he's going to keep his promises to us and i think that is such a, a for me personally, it is such an encouraging thought. Oh, my heart leaps. That my God is going to meet all of my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Not all my wants, but all of my needs are going to be met. And not that just God cares for me more than the lilies of the field, the birds of the air. He cares for me. And, and not just you and I, but the nations of the earth. He is sovereign over all the earth and the universe. And yeah. he is such a king and ruler that he who can thwart his will exactly when he determines it and states it it yeah. will be done it will be done <coughs> and you know uh, it, it's an interesting thing i think also the the fact that israel exists today is just further evidence that as you said a moment ago god really does love his creation that's all his cre all of his creation and and by the way when we sin against god there are always consequences for those choices but that has nothing to do with the love god has that's right you know you're a father you have a family. Yes. I have children, grandchildren. We love our children, but there are times when our children disobey and they have to be disciplined. And we do them a dis disservice not to do that. That's right. According to the teaching of the word of God. And so uh, one day when uh, we, my, uh, our children were small, our youngest daughter did something, and I forget what it was, but she, uh, I went to get my wooden spoon. And she took off running. We happened to be visiting at my <coughs> mom's and dad's house at the time. And she and we had a lot of family. It was a holiday of some kind. Uh -huh. We had a lot of family was there and so forth. She comes running through the house. He's going to beat me. He's going to uh, beat oh me. And here I and I got so tickled. I started laughing. I, I couldn't stand it. But I, I told her, I said, yeah, that's right. When I catch you, I'm going to. But why would I do that? Because I was angry? No. Because she had broke, she had done something she knew what she wasn't supposed to do. There's a consequence to that choice, and she had to learn that. Well, let me tell you something. God had to teach the Jewish people that also. Boy, has he. had he. to teach them. And through the centuries, they, as Ezekiel calls them, time after time and time again, and I want to say this very lovingly, uh, God says, you are a rebellious and a stiff-necked people. They were, they were hard. Oh, yeah. And, but, but God's love for them was so great that he would not let them go on in their sin. It was that very resolve of will that uh, was probably part of the makeup God put in them to help them persevere th through the centuries. Yeah, because I think you could see that as well. And so, mm -hmm. you know, a strength can become a weakness, a curse can become a blessing. Certainly. But yeah. uh, that's if the case. applied properly. And so the Jewish the, the story of Israel is truly a miracle. Uh, and I, I love to tell that story because if you know uh, it's been a passion in my life since 1971. I've been to Israel so many times and had the joy of sharing that experience with so many people because I am convinced that in the average church today, and if you're a watcher today and you, you, you may think about this in your own church, so many churches today, they never talk about Israel today in the present. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we, we, we have our Bible study or Sunday school type lessons and all. We, we hear about the Israelites and so forth and so on. But nobody really ever explains that there is a continuity of a plan that is there starts you go. in Genesis, ends in Revelation. God is working through over time with his people, the chosen people. And by the way, it does not negate the role that in, that in the, the fact that in the first 11 chapters, 2,000 years, and then in the, after from Genesis 12 on, we have the second 2,000 years, and there's Jews uh -huh. and Gentiles on the face of the earth. But then in Acts chapter 2, 
this last nearly 2,000 years, the church of Jesus. And we're reminded that, that the scripture tells us that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. But that does not negate the role that Israel plays in the current situation. Right. Hopefully we'll talk about that in our next program. And, and as an interesting uh, kind of aside, but, you know, the miracle of Pentecost reversed the curse of Babylon. Absolutely. Because as they were born in the spirit and not yeah. in the flesh, suddenly they were uh, able to see and understand these languages they hadn't learned. It was yeah. the opposite of the yeah. judgment of Genesis 11. Yeah. The world, all, all the languages are confused. Now all of a sudden everybody's hearing the gospel in their own tongue. Exactly. And so, you know, I, I'm reminded, you know, I start the book off by asking the question, uh, have, do you believe in miracles? Uh, have you ever witnessed a miracle? And, you know, what you find is, is that most people say, well, I, I think I believe in miracles. They're a little, ambi- you know, a little yeah. uh, uncertain about that, a little ambiguity there. Uh, but then they, all, they say, well, I don't know that I've ever seen a miracle. And so I love when a person tells me that because I ask them, well, uh, have you come to a saving faith in Christ? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I've given my life to Christ. Then look in the mirror because you, you are, a are a miracle. You have moved. You were, who, who were dead in your sin and your, tra- your trespasses <coughs> and sin are now alive in Christ. That is a great miracle. Amen. Well, we're talking with Gary Frazier. Uh, the subject is uh, really Israel. Uh, the resource is his new book, Miracle of Israel, mm-hmm. uh, co-authored with Jim Fletcher. But I think you've done uh, a great portion of this yourself well jim's a great friend and he's added some really valuable uh input into this book he's He's a great guy great writer friend of our ministry as well Mm -hmm. but we're making this available to you viewers uh the cost is 13.99 and shipping and handling and as always you can go to the website prophecyinthenews.com or call the 800 number on your screen and um, gary tells me that he's going to be making an audio version of this that will be released so be watching for updates on that from our website. Yeah, for those people who just uh, would rather listen than read. Yeah. And you know, one of the interesting things, too, that uh, we'll talk about in our next segment is that uh, uh, when, when we begin to move from the past into the present tense, well, there's an acceleration of God at work, and it is so exciting to see how God is working in history to literally fulfill. And I, one of the questions that I always ask people is, are you watching for God? And, and how he he's working in the, not only the affairs of the world, but in your own personal life. Because if you're watching, you'll see God's hand at work. Completely. His, his fingerprints are all over uh, everything if you're paying attention. And we don't live in a vacuum today. Fortunately, we live in a time when, when uh, as you know, and you and I have talked about this before on this very program. I believe Israel, um, the birth of Israel on May 14th of 1948, was the beginning of the terminal generation. Yeah. And because they exist in their land today, uh, exactly in the way that the prophets foretold, God brought them back in 1948, just like he wrote in Ezekiel chapter 20, in a spirit of unbelief. But God is working with them, and, the, and they're back in the land because God is not finished with them yet. He will deal with them in the tribulation period. And right now, he's just setting the world stage for what is about to happen soon. And the soon that's about to happen is the coming of Christ for those of us who know him. So Israel is a reminder <coughs> to get out of bed every day, to look up for our redemption draws nigh, to be faithful in our Bible study time, our prayer life, to be willing to share the gospel when God brings people across our path and gives us that opportunity. We need to have a willingness to just simply be obedient to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit within us when he tells us to speak up and share because truly the fields are wide into harvest, but the laborers are few. Very, very well said, Gary. Gary Frazier we're talking with, and y- you might listen to this if you're not as familiar with the scope of the Bible and think, well, you guys just have a love affair with Israel. <laughs> <laughs> we have a love affair with Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the actual total fruit uh, that comes from the nation of Israel. But God says, and he said it in Genesis 12, and he said it in the Old Testament prophets, and it says it in Romans 9, that by crafting a nation who would be his servant, that nation would take his word to the world. That nation would give us the scripture. And all of our scripture, save maybe the, the books of Luke and Acts, are by Jewish writers. And there's some debate that maybe Luke was even Jewish. Mm-hmm. So the word of God comes through the Jewish people. The covenants come through the Jewish people. The temple and its worship, all the sacrifices and types of Christ. And then the Messiah himself is born 
through the Jewish people. Uh, Jesus ascended in a glorified eternal body mm -hmm. uh, through which still courses Jewish blood. Yep. And, and he died as king of the Jews. Yes, he's king of the Jews. He's king of all, mm -hmm. king of kings and Lord of lords. So our love affair is not really with just the ethnic group of Israel, but it's to recognize that God gave them a very strategic role in preparing mankind for his salvation. And Christ is that ultimate Absolutely. Savior. And, uh, and one of the interesting things too, Kevin, I know that uh, you've been to Israel a number of times and I've been there a number of times. It's always a joy to, to be in the city, uh, in the country of Israel, but in the city of Jerusalem in particular. I'm always reminded as I walk through the old city and I see all these old, you know, Jewish people, you know, they're sitting there and they have a cane sitting beside uh -huh. them. And there are little children running around and playing, especially in the area of the old city near the Cardo. And I'm reminded that Zechariah writes about how uh, when the Jews return to the land, the the old men will sit in, on, in the streets. The children will play in the streets. You'll hear the sounds of laughter once again and so forth. And all of those things are just really, once again, I, I just remind our viewers, all of these things are screaming that the end is upon us. In front us. of our eyes. And, uh, you know, today as we're in this world that seemingly is, seems to be coming apart on, in every strata of our culture and society, we take great confidence in knowing he is on the throne, his plan is going to be fulfilled. Israel gives testimony to that great truth. Amen. Well, if you don't know Jesus yourself as your Savior and as the Messiah, he's not only the King of Israel, he's the Savior of the world. And as he came and gave his life, it was for all people. It was that all might believe, that all might receive the everlasting life. And Christ has come supernaturally. Uh, even as Isaac was born supernaturally, mm -hmm. Christ was born of a virgin. Isaac was offered uh, on the mount. Uh, and just before Abram plunged in the, the knife to take his life, his hand was stayed and he received Isaac back as a type of Christ who literally died on the mount and was raised from the dead. What's left is for you to call on the name of the Lord, believe in your heart and be saved. Mm -hmm. Come to Jesus today and we'll keep looking up.